So hi everyone. Um, welcome to our ethics seminar series. Um, today we are thrilled to have um, Dr. Bill Blankwell um, with us. So Bill um, received um, his um, BE degree in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech and the SM and SCD degrees in electric engineering as well and computer science from MIT. Uh, since 2002, he's been with uh, Lincoln Laboratory, MIT, where he's currently an associate leader of the Applied Space System Group. He serves and has um, previously served on the NASA Atmospheric Infrared Sounder and NPP science teams, the Joint Polar Satellite System Sounding Up Operational Angrizer team, and the National Academy of Science Co Committee on Radio Frequencies. So Bill is a, a fellow of IEEE and the recipient of the 2009 Noah David Johnson Award for his research in neural, neural, uh, neural network retrievals and microwave calibrations, and the uh, 2012 recipient of the IEEE Region 1 um, Manager real excellence in engineering organization. Uh, let's welcome the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. Is my mic on and working? Can we get confirmation that you guys can hear me? Yes. The online guys. Um, so I was talking to some folks before this. So we're you know very excited about this tropics mission. I think it's going to be a, a, an innovative. Um, you know, a new way of making Earth observations that I think will, will augment what we're already doing and take us even further into, you know, the, the quality of Earth observation systems. And what, what this is, <clears throat> uh, Tropics is a constellation of six CubeSats that are about the size of a loaf of bread with scanning multi-channel passive microwave radiometers. And the idea is to make, you know, imagery of tropical cyclones and dynamic uh, storms measurements of temperature and moisture. And with the constellation of six of these, we can make the measurements much more frequently, right? So we can improve our temporary visit time, and we can, for the first time, start to capture the dynamics of tropical cyclones and, and weather that's evolving rapidly. Um, so what we get out of this, so I'll talk about, this talk has a number of components to it. There's a lot of really nice hardware that we've built um, that are going in these very small radiometers. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the hardware and the technology development. Um, the science objectives we're trying to do with the mission. But the key thing here is the revisit rate. So we're trying to push down the 40 minute median revisit um, over the tropical cyclone belt. That's almost a factor of 10 better than what we get today with our current polar network. So it's quite a step forward. Uh, this is a NASA Earth Venture mission. Um, I'll, I'll go into who, who we're working with. Scott Braun at NASA Goddard is our, our project scientist. And we have a host of, of collaborators on the science team and on the instrument build. And you'll see that we're actually relying very heavily on the commercial space sector for some of the hardware that we're building for this. Um, so I'll go into this. And feel free as I go through this, you can ask questions as I go, whatever you would like to, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well. All right, so let's see if I can make this go forward one. Ding as I hit the, so let's try this. Okay, that works. All right, so, um, I, so I think I last gave the seminar in Japan, and this is the slide that I showed them just to motivate why it is important that we do a good job and an even better job of forecasting tropical cyclones. So they have enormous societal economic uh, impact. Uh, this is one example of a storm that, that caused, you know, billion dollars in damages, uh, significant loss of life. So we really need to do a better job of understanding how these storms behave, how we can forecast them, how we can use our Earth observing network to better um, observe and forecast these types of storms. Um, so here's a plot that you know we've we've all seen, right? The the, the you know the cone of uncertainty. We have a storm. This happens to be Hurricane Irma approaching the eastern coast of the U.S. We we make a forecast. This is a Thursday in the morning. We think it's going to hit the eastern coast. Issue a warning, and what happens? Well, it changes course. It actually goes off the kind of the western coast of Florida, more to the Gulf. And this is the kind of thing we need to improve, right? So this causes all kinds of problems where we've, we've given a, a warning over here where these guys, the next time they get a warning, maybe they, uh, you know, they, don't, they don't heed that. Um, so there's you know, a tremendous motivation to do a better job with the forecasting, emergency management, uh, and so forth. So this is really what we're trying to do is improve the, the forecast of the track and the intensity of the storm as it's evolving 
um, and intensifying. Okay. So to do that from an observational point of view, there are a couple of key, what I'll call thermodynamic variables of the storm. Uh, one of them is humidity. All right? So the storm is, is, is forming. This warm, moist air fuels the storm. It's the engine, in a lot of ways, that makes the storm intensify. So we need to measure a humidity profile. It's a humidity as a function of altitude um, and three dimensions around the storm. And we need to do this with rapid update. Okay, so there's really four dimensions. Um, so this is humidity. We also need to do uh, a good job with temperature profiling in and around the storm. So here is a cross section through the eye of the storm. And something interesting happens. So there's this warm anomaly and, and aloft in the eye. And the, the, the magnitude of this anomaly uh, is very highly correlated to the intensity of the storm. So this is something that we can measure uh, quite well with a passive microwave radiometer. Um, and we can do this with sufficient resolution. And we can resolve the, the hurricane eye and say something about intensity through this, 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 di this direct relationship between warm core and intensification. And then finally, precipitation. So we can measure, to some degree, uh, precipitation uh, with a passive microwave instrument. So the, the, the key physical markers are the, are the scattering off of the, you know, the water and, the, and ice in the clouds uh, and the emission. So we can do a fairly good job of rain rate retrieval. It's not the best uh, sensor for measuring rain rate, but we get useful signatures through the scattering so we can, we can resolve the, the rain bands and look at the uh, asymmetry of the rain band uh, as they you know, are forming off the storm and so forth. And that's also a, a marker of intensification. Those are really the, the three key variables. And we need to measure those with sufficient resolution in space and time. So we're going after this four dimensional 3D space plus time of sufficiently high resolution to resolve the, the inner processes of the storms. So from an observation perspective, those are the objectives and this sets the requirements on the observatory and how good the radiometers need to be. All right, so not only are these complex processes, but the, the frequency with which we see the storms is, is pretty remarkable. So here's a single day back in 2018. And you see there, there's nine of these storms either uh, raging or forming over the course of the globe. So you've got to do this on a global scale, right? So not only is there high spatial resolution, but we have to have global coverage to get all these things captured. So it's a, it's a fairly daunting task for an observing system to do all these things. But we think we can do that with a constellation. All right, so there are a number of measurements that you might think about to, to capture those dynamics. And here's a little bit of a summary. So ground-based radar are great uh, for measuring precipitation, um, but we don't have these over ocean. We've got the GPM, things like the GPR, but those are, are uh, spatially sparse. So those are, are not uh, you know, available a lot. Um, so these are great when we have them, but we don't have them very often over ocean. Uh, we can drop things out of airplanes, but again, we have spatial sparsity. There are new sensors like Cygnus that are coming online. Uh, that are trying to measure ocean surface winds with, with some success. Um, geostationary sensors would be great to stare down at a storm and get very high revisit rates. But currently, we can only fly visible and IR sensors on a geo platform. So we can't penetrate below the cloud tops. So a passive microwave sounding system is a really nice compromise of all the things that you'd want to make this measurement. We can retrieve the, the temperature, humidity, precipitation with sufficient resolution. I mean, these are not the, the best of breed in any sense, but taken together, they're a good compromise of you know, the fidelity and the spatial resolution of the measurements to, to make the, the observations that we need to drive the forecast. So that sends us down uh, this, this path of a constellation of cross-track scanning microwave sounders. There's another way of, of looking at this chart, and that is you know, if I try to assimilate the data into a numerical model, how useful is the data? Kind of writ large, what kind of impact am I getting from all these data sources? Um, this is one uh, trial. This is the ECMWF model from a few years ago. And so these are all the different kinds of data. And at the top of this, so the most useful, the most impactful data, according to this particular study, is the humidity and precipitation at the top, which is a bit of a surprise. We've come a long way with our ability to assimilate you know, rain impacted uh, water vapor data, and this is showing that here. Microwave temperature is number two, okay? So there's at the top of this chart are the microwave data. Uh, so again, further motivation that we need to make a lot of measurements in the microwave and improve their temporal revisit. So again, that's what's driving um, the, the, the tropics motivation, this need for microwave measurement. Okay, 
So in terms of the atmospheric physics, what we're exploiting to make these four-dimensional um, observations are these absorption lines in the atmosphere due to oxygen and water vapor. So here's an example. So there's an absorption line due to oxygen at 118.75 gigahertz right here. And what we do is we cite channels um, gradually off this line, and that allows us to penetrate closer to the surface as we go away from the line. So Tropics has eight channels near this line that allow us to put together a profile of temperature. Here's a little schematic of that. So as I go off the line, I see deeper towards the surface. As I go towards the line, I see farther up in the atmosphere because there's more attenuation in the atmosphere and so forth. So by looking at all these channels, I can build up a whole profile of the temperature or the water vapor if you use a water vapor line. Uh, so Tropics has 12 channels. There are eight of them here. Uh, the other four are for water vapor, and I'll get into some details of that. So we've been flying microwave sensors for many decades, right, a long time, and they were great, okay. But um, the, the satellites that we need to host these, you know, are, are pretty big. Here's somebody leaning over the desk here for some scale. They're expensive. They take a long time to build and test. Some of them, you in the room I was talking about, we're, we're testing um, the, the third, you know, the next JPSS satellite now. And it takes a long time to build and test these, and it's worth it. I mean, they, they make great measurements. Uh, but we don't have a lot of these, right? So there are only a small handful of these orbiting sensors in very specific orbits. And that gives us, you know, a four to six hour revisit rate, which is not sufficient to resolve uh, the dynamics that we're trying to capture with these storms. We need, so we need more of these. Um, so the idea of Tropics is, well, look, can we, can we make these satellites or these instruments um, smaller, more affordable, and fly a lot more of them while keeping a lot of the, um, the advantages that the measurements that they make offer, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so technology-wise, to make that happen has been quite, uh, you know, extensive over the last decade now. Um, we we're trying to figure out, okay, so how do we take an ATMS sensor that's this big and make it this big and still maintain, um, you know, the usefulness of the measurement? So as you can probably imagine, um, there needs to be a lot of work done on the receivers that make the measurements, um, the calibration, uh, the back-end processes to derive those 12 channels that I talked about. And, uh, you know, how I got started in this, as a grad student, um, we started to fly aircraft instruments, and we showed that if you use millimeter waves, um, 118 gigahertz as opposed to 60, um, there is sufficient sensitivity to a lot of these hydrometeors that we're trying to measure with a tropical storm. You get useful information at 118. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not as good as 60, but in some ways, it's better. So we can certainly exploit 118, and that gives us the opportunity to make a smaller antenna, okay, and we can actually fit that on a CubeSat. So over the past you know, eight to 10 years, we've been working on the technology that we need to make this possible, and then proving that it will work in a very compact, low-cost platform. So in the middle here, we built a number of CubeSats in collaboration with MIT campus, the Air Astro Department. These are very low-cost, you know, $100,000 class buses, just so we can prove the concept. So we did MicroMass 1, uh, which had a single temperature sounding radiometer, uh, Murata had a dual band system for the first time. And then last year, early last year, we flew the Micromass 2, which for the first time took all of this technology and put it in a package where we have a scanning radiometer, multi-band observations, and we showed that we could do this measurement very well. And with this existence proof, um, the idea is, well, now let's proliferate a constellation and fly a lot of these things, right? Get the measurements over the globe uh, very frequently. So that's what's the springboard of this has launched the tropics. Um, so I'll talk about the tropics next. But first, let me just give you a couple of uh, slides on the MicroMass 2. All right, so we're very happy about this. So we built this and flew it early last year. Um, here is a picture of the 3U CubeSat, very small. Um, and here's ATMS, which is making fantastic measurements. So here's an ATMS image flying over northern Alaska. Uh, this is a, happens to be a, 90, a channel near 90 gigahertz, and here's the MicroMass 2 data you know, with a similar channel. And the data is, is really good, right? So we, we've proven that we can geolocate the satellite. Um, the data quality is very nice. Uh, we've done some absolute calibration work that shows that this is, a, this is a viable way to make these measurements, right? So if we can do this, let's fly a lot of them, right, and get this very frequently. So that was really the idea behind Tropics, is to fly a constellation of these small, low-cost radiometers and get a lot more data um, of high quality. Uh, so the Tropics mission, there actually is an acronym, 
Um, the, the time resolved observations of precipitation structure and storm intensity with a constellation of small sets all fits together. So this is a NASA Earth Venture. This was EVI 3 selected back in 2016. Um, so this is a first for NASA. This is, I think this is the first time that they've used CubeSats for a no kidding science mission that has requirements in their, what they call their program level requirements appendix, right? So we are on the hook not to demonstrate technology, but to demonstrate science for NASA using CubeSats. Um, so the, the budget is 30 million. So this is, a, you know, this is a small fraction of the $2 billion that you saw before. And we're trying to do a very focused piece of the mission. Um, for you know, a very small amount of money here. And this pays for the hardware and the data processing, the science team, everything except for the launch, which NASA pays for. Uh, so the good news is that we've essentially finished all the hardware. I'll show you that here in a second. So now we're waiting on NASA to find us launches. So I'll talk about our orbital configuration, but it's gonna turn out that we're gonna need three launches to populate our constellation. I'll talk about why that is. So NASA's off going to do that now, and we hope to launch in a, in a one, one to two years, maybe three years. And here are all our partners on the, on the science side. So we're working with uh, Wisconsin, NOAA, NASA, um, and some universities um, to do all the processing and, and the science case studies and so forth. So that's a thumbnail sketch. Let me get into a few more details. Um, so I mentioned that this is a science mission for NASA. So here are our science objectives. Um, and, and really the key takeaway here is we're looking for linkages from things that we can measure usefully with a, a microwave radiometer, the temperature, moisture, precipitation, and ask the question, can we link those things that we can measure to intensity changes? Can we link structure, the rain bands and the asymmetry and so forth, to intensity? Okay. So we're trying to um, you know, identify and exploit those linkages. They say, say something about intensity and ultimately use that improved knowledge to improve our ability to forecast the storms. That's where we're going with this. So here are just a couple of examples of the things that we're trying to exploit. So here is a plot. So I'm showing you a storm intensifying over the course of 10 days. So here this is pressure. Um, so it really starts to intensify after about day three and a half. Very intense after seven days and then it starts to dissipate. All right, so these are Hovmiller diagrams. So this is rainfall. I'm showing you rainfall as a function of radius away from the center. So here's the calm eye here in the middle and, and as it's evolving over time. And the things we're trying to capture with these radiometers is, is the rain bands you know, coming off of the, of the storm, right? There is a diurnal signature here. Um, there is highly dynamic behavior that we're trying to capture. And here are two simulations of two channels on tropics. So we can see that we can um, adequately capture these, these temporal, spatial temporal signatures from the rain. And these are the markers that we're going to try to use to uh, better understand and predict intensity. On the spectral side, so here is some data from a sensor called MWHS2, which is flying on a Chinese FY3C satellite. Um, so this is a slice through the hurricane. The, eye, the center of the hurricane is right here. There's a little black marker. So here's the eye. And here poking up is this warm core anomaly that I talked about earlier. So here is an example um, of this warm core anomaly that we can measure. This is actual data, okay? We can relate this to intensity. So we're gonna try to make this kind of measurement, again, with very high update rate uh, with tropics. So those are the things we're gonna try to exploit. All right, so a thumbnail sketch of the mission implementation is shown here. All right, so we've got uh, six satellites in the constellation. And we put these in three very specific orbital planes. So we've got two satellites in each of three planes. And if you look really carefully, you may be able to, to make out the tracks of the, of the two satellites in each of their orbital planes here. Um, you can see, I'll show you why. We don't, we don't go beyond about 40 degree latitude, right? And there's a reason for that. Um, here are our ground stations. So we're contracting with a commercial space company called KSAT provide us ground stations to downlink our data. So we have a primary station in South Africa and a couple other backup stations um, throughout the globe. Um, so I should point out that, so the latency of tropics is, is not particularly great because it's, this is a science mission. This is not an operational class mission. So NASA is not really concerned with latency. Um, so we'll, we'll do, you know, about a day of latency, which is terrible for those of you who are in operational. You want the data much more quickly than that. And the good news on that is if, if for us to make that happen, all we need to do is write a bigger check to KSAT and have them turn on more ground stations, right? And we get the data down within, you know, an hour, hour and a half. So that, that could be done. 
um, if the community wanted that. We're exploring some options on how we might do that, at least some of the time. Um, so we have contracted with another commercial company, Blue Canyon Technologies in Boulder, Colorado. They're making our spacecraft, the CubeSat buses that I'll talk about. And they're also doing our mission operations. And they're, they're what we call the MOC, the Mission Operations Center. Uh, we're doing science operations at Lincoln Lab where I work. And Wisconsin is doing the data processing um, using their, their SIPs infrastructure. They've been doing this for many years. And they're going to do that for tropics. And then the data will go to the Goddard DAC for consumption by the general public. All right, so why do we pick this somewhat strange orbital configuration? Um, well, here's why. All right, so if we plot the tropical cyclone tracks for, this is a 30-year time period, uh, you see something interesting, right? There's almost never any storms right near the equator, and there's almost never any storms you know, outside of this 40-degree uh, latitude band. Um, so if I take this chart and integrate with latitude, I get something looks like this. So most of the storms are actually happening, you know, plus minus 20 latitude, right? Almost nothing outside of 40, and almost nothing at zero. So I can optimize my observatory when I launch the constellation um, to, to try to match this, right? I want to put the most sensitive observations where the storms are most frequent, right? And it turns out I can do that. Okay, so here's the plot that I just showed you uh, on its side. So by tilting the, the, the inclination of the orbits to 30 degrees, uh, putting the satellites in a 550 kilometer altitude, and given the wide swath of the radiometers, I can actually make the peak sensitivity in terms of revisit align with the storm frequency. Right? So that's the magic of, with only six satellites, um, I can achieve um, almost 30 minute median, I can get to about 40 minute median revisit time with six satellites if I put them in these planes. Right? So that's a little bit of a trick for tropics. We've got to have those, that particular configuration. Um, so here are some statistics on the spatial and temporal resolution of tropics. And let me start with this lower left figure first. Um, because what this shows you um, is the sensitivity of the temporal revisit as a function of the configuration of the constellation orbit. Right? So I just showed you six satellites, um, two satellites in each orbital plane. That's this point right here. That's our baseline mission. Okay? And the curves I'm showing you are the mean and median revisit as a function of the number of satellites, how many I put on each plane. And there's a very steep drop off down to about four satellites. So we certainly want to have at least four satellites in our constellation. Um, and then the, then the, the improvement um, is, it has a much you know, shallower um, trend beyond four. So we, 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 we define four satellites as what we call our threshold mission. We have to have four satellites working. Um, but our baseline is six. So that allows us to have a couple of satellites um, fail, and we can still fulfill our mission. With, with only modest degradation in performance. Okay, so, so with this uh, four or six satellite constellation, we can get really close to our 60 minute median revisit as our, as our requirement. We can do that here. Um, we also, we have a, you know, we, we've done some analysis on you know, how reliable are these satellites that you're building. They're low cost. Um, there's no free lunch, right? So what hit do you take with reliability? And the good news with that is we have reliability by virtue of the constellation. We can have a couple of failures and still meet our objectives. Right? We have um, a 90% probability that we have four vehicles after one year. Okay, so that's another driver for setting the threshold at four and our baseline at six. So we have fairly high confidence that after one year, um, we'll be able to meet our objectives. Um, now back to the top left. So here are some comparisons with ATMS that I think a lot of you are familiar with. So here are spatial resolutions for temperature. So I'm showing you the, the number on the left is for nadir, and then this number on the right is average across the entire swath. So at nadir, ATMS is about 33. Um, Tropics is 24, so it's, it's better than ATMS for two reasons. Number one, we're flying lower, okay? So we're 550, not 824, and we're using 118 gigahertz, not 60 gigahertz, okay? So fair comparison, um, we're, we're doing that to get this number um, smaller than ATMS, but ATMS has got 60 gigahertz oxygen temperature channels, so they're a little more sensitive. Uh, moisture, we are comparable with ATMS, 16 kilometer at nadir, um, 30 kilometer for our 90 gigahertz imaging channel, and the swath is very wide. So we have a 2,000 kilometer wide swath from our orbits, um, and that is also part of how we can get you know, very good global coverage with only six satellites. Okay. 
All right, so uh, let me get into a little more details on to how we build these things, what, 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 what they're made of, what they comprise, and how we test them. All right, so here is an overview of the CubeSat. And I still am pretty astounded at how much we can pack into this very small volume. So this is a six kilogram satellite, okay, 36 centimeters uh, on an edge here. And there are fundamentally two pieces to this. There's the CubeSat bus, which is this part that Blue Canyon Technologies has built. And it's got some amazing technology. There's a, there's a solar array that is articulating to track the sun as we orbit. Um, there are two star trackers for attitude determination. Um, there's a full duplex S-band radio, uh, the reaction wheels to counteract the fact that not only is this payload moving, and not only is the solar array moving, we also roll the bus to track the ground stations as we fly over them, right? So we've got, we've got four things moving. We've got the array moving, the bus moving, the payload moving, and the reaction wheels moving to counteract all that. So we've got to do all that and keep the pointing stable. So it's a challenging thing that we, we can do with this. There's GPS on board, torque rods, avionics, power, batteries, all the things you need to run a satellite in this very small And at Lincoln Lab, we built the payload, okay? So we've got this 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube um, that's rotating at 30 RPM. We want the, the aperture to be as large as possible for the best spatial resolution on the ground. Um, so we have an 83 millimeter aperture, uh, and that means that we need to have the electronics of very, very small to fit in that cube, right? So a lot of miniaturization. Um, we use a noise diode for calibration. That is a, a, a somewhat of a departure from what we've typically done. Um, that means your noise diode has to be very reliable and very stable over time. So we do a lot of testing, lifetime testing and TVAC calibration testing to ensure that that will happen. Uh, see, I've talked about the 12 channels from 90 to 205. All these things, they fold up into this nice package. It's put into a dispenser, which is spring-loaded, and when we launch, that springs it out and everything deploys and we start to operate. So here's a little, little animation that shows what's going on in orbit. So the, I've, I've frozen the payload, so the payload will be spinning as well, but you can see that the, the bus is rotating slowly, the array is rotating slowly, track the sun as we go over the orbit. So this is nice because we can, you know, given that we can track the sun, that means we can make the array sizes smaller, we can make the power system smaller, um, and, and lower the cost. And one cool thing about having this payload it scans 360 degrees, a full, you know, the, the, the full range of, of motion here. We can scan the Earth, we can scan the cold sky, we can look at the moon and the sun, and we can actually try to use those for calibration points. All right, uh, so here, again, a little more detail on the, uh, the physics of the atmosphere. So here I talked about the 118 gigahertz line. We also use the 183.31 line for water vapor. And we have bracketing this, we have a channel at 90 gigahertz for imaging and a channel at 205, uh, really for cloud ice scattering. We use very sensitive to cloud ice scattering. And we, of course, we use the microwave to penetrate the clouds um, for the forecast impact. So here is a lot of details for the one or two of you in the audience maybe that, that like to look at this stuff in terms of how, you know, the bandwidth of the channels. Um, they are narrower near the line and broader away from the line. Um, the beam widths of the antenna, we work really hard to get, um, you know, very narrow beams and also very low side lobe levels. We need very high beam efficiency, otherwise we'll be corrupted by measurements outside our main field of view. So a very, very nice antenna system um, to yield the, uh, the spatial resolutions that I talked about earlier. And the sensitivity of the radiometer is also very good. Um, this is an 8.3 millisecond integration time. Um, so numbers that are comparable, in some cases actually better than the first ATMS for the channel, for example, this channel near the water vapor line. That's a very good number uh, for water vapor sensitivity. Okay, so we have built seven of these, and two pieces of good news there. Number one, we have a lot of margin against our requirements. This is temperature profile uncertainty and water vapor profile uncertainty. Um, so we have a lot of margin here, and number one. Number two, the results are co fairly consistent, right? So these radiometers perform um, you know, consistent with each other. And so we've tried to simulate all the air sources that we're going to see on orbit, not just the noise, but calibration air, um, geolocation air, all that is rolled into this. We've been doing a lot of analyses like these to you know, convince ourselves that we're going to meet requirements from a science perspective. Okay. Uh, let's see. So here are just a few more details on the temperature sounding. So here are the weighting functions. 
Um, we have you know, the, the solid retinator. As I scan out, what happens is the weighting functions actually lift up off the ground a little bit for the temperature sounding band. So the resolution vertically um, for a microgrammeter is not great. So we're, you know, it's, it's maybe three to four kilometers, sometimes two. Uh, but again, this is good enough to resolve that warm core anomaly and good enough to do the measurements that we need um, to improve the, the accuracy of the forecast. Here's temperature, here's water vapor. Again, we're trying to span vertically the space of the, of the moisture. Um, here's the 205 gigahertz channel down here, which is something we don't have on ATMS. Uh, and here are five main science products. So I've mentioned temperature profile, moisture profile, uh, instantaneous surface rain rate, and also two intensity products. So it's what we call a mean sea level pressure and a maximum sustained wind. So this is not a, re a spatially resolved wind product. This is a number for the whole storm, essentially how, how intense the storm is with respect to the, 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 you know, the maximum wind of the storm. Um, so we have a, you know, a threshold and a baseline requirement. Um, and here is our, our current projection of how well we're going to stack up. So the performance looks very good. Uh, we've worked really hard to look at a number of data sets and run our algorithms um, on these to you know, ensure that we're going to meet performance. And I should mention again, we have a one-year science collection period. So that's our requirement. We hope to go beyond that, but we, we have to be up for at least a year. Okay. Um, so a few details on the radiometer. I think we we're really proud of at Lincoln Lab to make this radiometer small and, and work very well. Okay, so here's the animation we're scanning in. Once every two seconds, we do a full revolution. We scan across the Earth with a very wide swath. Uh, we scan across cold sky. We turn the noise diode on for some period of time to calibrate. We've got a cold cow point and a warm cow point. And also, okay, so this is not in a sun synchronous orbit. Okay, so we will see the sun and the moon essentially every orbit. That's a lot of observations of the sun and moon, which we can try to use um, to calibrate uh, the system and try to, for example, track any drift from the noise diode using the, the sun and the moon. So we're working on that. Um, I think that's a very interesting line of research, how far we can push that type of analysis. So here are some uh, kind of nuts and bolts details on integration times and antenna beam widths and swaths that I won't go into detail unless you, you want to later. I mentioned the eight millisecond integration time. Um, and so I, I think one, one area, you know, when we started this is the, is the noise diode, right? So how good is that noise diode calibration going to be? And how stable will it be? So this is really uh, a relatively new way to do this calibration. So there's some, some good news on the calibration with noise diodes. One piece of good news is I mentioned the GPM mission. There's a microwave sensor on there called GMI, uh, which has been flying noise diodes up to 36 gigahertz for five years. And the stability of these noise diodes has been phenomenally good. Right? So here, there's not all of them, but here most of them are, are you know, stable to a tenth of a degree over five years. So that is very good news. We're using this, actually the same diodes are very close to these diodes that GMI has used, but we're using them at higher frequencies, right? So we're going um, up to 205 gigahertz. So we've been working hard in, in TVAC to um, assess the level of stability, um, you know, on, on this kind of a scale. And we, we, we think that we're going to be pretty close to that. Um, I mean, the noise diodes on GMI are so good that they can actually use these to detect thermal drifts in the onboard calibration targets, right? The onboard targets are not perfect. They have gradients, the sun can hit them. Um, they all warm up and you're seeing that here, the noise diodes are actually showing you you've got an error on your internal calibration target, right? When you try to put a, a target on a CubeSat, I mean, the problems, um, you know, multiply to the, you know, the third or fourth power. You have such a small volume to contain a calibration target and it's almost impossible to shroud the target and avoid these kinds of effects on your calibration target. So we are very encouraged by our noise diode testing results. All right, so uh, here is the payload and exploded view. So again, we try to make the antenna as large as we can to uh, improve our spatial resolution. And the regret of doing that is that makes your electronics need to be as small as possible, right? So we have the front end for our temperature band, um, the front end for our water vapor band, the back end channelizer for the temperature sounder. Uh, the scanner, which rotates the payload at 30 RPM. There's a slip ring in there. Pass the data back to the spacecraft bus, control data handling, and this thing kind of snaps together um, in a very compact, highly integrated package. It's amazing. So here, 
Uh, here are some photographs of the hardware. So the antenna, I think we're very proud of this. So there, there, there are two feeds uh, that illuminate a dichroic wire grid. There's a very, um, uh, almost no loss at all on this dichroic. So that's how we get the, the, the very narrow beams and the very high beam efficiency in a small package. Here's the front end um, for the temperature band that UMass Amherst built for us. A company called VDI built the G-band direct attack. Full data handling is a very compact scanning motor and a channelizer that we built. Um, and, and, and this dates back to some uh, NASA ESTO funding. Um, almost eight years ago, we, we started to build these for ESTO. And that ESTO funding has actually rippled through all these things. That's been very helpful for us to, as we've built up the radiometer hardware. All right, so here it is. This is the actual hardware. This is unit number one, all put together. Two different shots of it, showing the, you know, the various receivers are tucked around in the edges and the corners of this thing. All the cabling, uh, local oscillator assemblies, this, the uh, scanning assembly at the bottom. Um, so it's very compact. I think it's pretty impressive how all this stuff fits together. Um, and it's kind of you know, tucked in the corners of this thing, and it, and it works. We've got a, another thing to point out is we have to balance this very uh, carefully, right? So we don't wobble as we're spinning around. Not only does that have to be lightweight, it has to be dynamically balanced so we don't introduce a wobble in the spacecraft as we turn the payload. Look really carefully, you might see there's some tungsten weights in here that we use to balance. Okay, so when we first conceived this, we thought, you know, there's going to be some sacrifices to be made, and there were, um, but we were very pleased having built and tested seven of these that we've achieved some of the best performance ever of a radiometer at any size. And these are just a couple of the highlights. In terms of the number of channels that we can pack into a small volume, this blows away anything that's ever been built. Uh, we have a very good spatial resolution, um, better than ATMS, if you, you, know, you have to remember that we're 118 and not 60, and we're flying lower. But even, even that, we're still very good. The antenna pattern performance is, is excellent. We actually had to build a special antenna range just to measure it. It was so good. The silos were so low, we had to build a special range for that. Uh, we've got very good receiver performance for the water vapor bands through that direct detect G-band system. Um, and we work really hard on our TVAC calibration to make sure that we can assess sensitivity, the stability, the noise diodes, linearity, all those things um, as the system will fly when it's on orbit. So I have a, a few slides on this TVAC setup coming up. Okay, so we built a custom system for this. So there's this uh, this jig here that slides into the TVAC chamber, and if you look carefully, you can see there are three calibration targets, very carefully uh, shrouded, and the payload is in the middle. So we turn the payload uh, in the TVAC chamber, and we, uh, we change the temperature of the targets to simulate what we'll see on orbit, and we change the temperature of the payload as to what we'll see on orbit. And we do this over the course of, uh, you know, weeks of all the payloads. And we assess the performance, right? And this is a very, if we do this right, this is a very um, accurate way to assess, you know, how good your radiometer will be, how stable will it be. And we also do some, in addition to this kind of testing, we do lifetime testing on all the mechanical parts and the, and the noise diodes to make sure they will last for at least as long as our one-year mission requirement. So here's what we're doing. Here, the temperatures of the targets are changing. This is time and days. So, we, you know, we have these various plateaus of the, of the scene. We step that over a wide range from uh, you know, over a couple of hundred degree Kelvin. Targets are changing, the payload is changing, and we try to operate this, you know, exactly like a day in the life of the radiometer as it's flying in orbit. We get a lot of good information out of that. Okay, so here's the, the space vehicle. Just to point out some of the parts, there's the GPS antenna, uh, the S-band patch antennas we're talking to the ground, uh, the SATA for spinning the array. Okay, so this is, this is the, I was showing this plot, you know, a year and a half ago, there's the CAD, it's going to look great, and now we've got the final. Here's the first unit, now we've got seven of these. So here's the, what we call the qual unit. We're going to fly six on orbit. We actually built seven. Um, this one was to prove that the design works. We tested this um, to a very high level, and we're going to actually try to fly this one in advance of the main mission um, to get a sense of the, you know, the, we can ring out our ground station, our science processing algorithms, and so forth. All right, so here's a video, the actual hardware. Um, the, you know, the ray turning, payload spinning. So this is the way it'll be operating in space, except for the bus will also be turning. So we, we, can't, we can't actually do a demo of all three things turning. Um, so here we go, here are the other six. So we have six of these flight vehicles ready to go. Here they are at Blue Canyon. Um, we're gonna do a little, bit of, a little bit more testing at the vehicle level at Lincoln Lab that's actually happening now as we speak. 
and then we'll be finished. We'll ship these off, and NASA will have to find us a ride. Okay, so how do we launch? Okay, so it's a, it's a $30 million mission. We, we can't, you know, NASA's not going to spend $60 million each for three, you know, Falcon 9s, right? This is, so we are hoping that the, the rocket labs and the Virgin Orbits and the, and the Fireflies of the world will, will come to market soon. Rocket Lab already has with, you know, single digit million dedicated launches, right? So we're kind of banking on that for tropics. So this is the Virgin Orbit Launcher 1. It's launched off a of 747. This would be great to get us into our inclined orbit. We, so Rocket Lab can't get us to 30 degrees from New Zealand, but they're starting to launch from Wallops where they think they can. So they're, you know, these are the things that have to be worked out before we launch the Constellation. Um, NASA's got to pick one of these providers and, and issue a contract. So that's, that work is going on now. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll get into the end here. Uh, so just a few words on, on how we assess performance of, of the science products and how the the performance ripples through from the hardware all the way to the product level. So these are uncertainty plots of the temperature profile and moisture profile, um, just showing that we, we, you know, we try to use a wide variety of representative profile data sets, simulate actual tropics observations, uh, and then run our algorithms and then compare the performance to our requirements. And as I showed you before, we have lots of margin on the profiles. Um, the rain rate product is, you know, is, is, is not the world's best, but it's okay. Um, so we have some early indications that the rain rate will be useful. I mean, it's not as good as GPM, right? It's not as good as a low frequency uh, microwave sounder, but it's okay. Uh, here's a point I wanted to make on, on the warm core anomalies, okay? So the best case for this is when there's a very strong storm and a very well resolved eye, okay? We get a very clear shot of the, of the warm core uh, to the tune of almost 10 Kelvin, and we can correlate that very nicely to the, uh, to the intensity of the storm. That works great. Now, the problem with this, this is a regret of using a millimeter wave band, is that when the storm is forming, um, the eye is not distinct. There's lots of cloud shrouding, and there's lots of scattering um, you know, off, off the clouds, and, and our ability to resolve the eye is diminished quite a bit for the, uh, for the weaker storms. And we've done some work to try to even resolve the eye in these cases with some success. We still get a signature, and we're working uh, with the science team to derive, you know, multi-channel type algorithms to, to mitigate to some degree the attenuation we get from cloud shrouding. But this is this is one of the deficiencies of using a millimeter wave radiometer is that we, we can't we always resolve, you know, um, the eye below the shrouded clouds. Here you see we make it we make an error for this particular case because of that cloud shrouding. Okay, so we have been doing uh, quite a bit of work with what we call OSSEs, these observing sim simulation system simulation experiments, um, to assess the forecasting performance both for track and intensity, um, using a variety of, of tropics, you know, thinning arrangements and, and so forth. And we're getting positive impact um, for, for track over the entire forecast time and for intensity at the beginning of the storm. Um, so that's encouraging. So we're trying to do things now where we use more of the data. Uh, to do a better job with intensity forecasting out for longer lead times and actually improve our, our uh, track forecast as well. So there's a lot of work going on here on the simulation side. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. So I think we're very excited to try to use this new constellation type observatory of relatively low cost CubeSats um, to take us where we've never been before in terms of you know, a 30 minute class revisit for storm um, observations. It's an observation we've been wanting to do for decades, which I'm able to do, but now CubeSats have enabled that. Um, so we'll get that with tropics. Uh, again, the key observables are temperature, moisture, precipitation. Um, our science team has been doing a lot of work with what we call proxy data to ring out the algorithms and, and improve the meet requirements. Uh, we finished the hardware essentially now, and we're waiting for a launch, um, NASA to find us a launch. And with that, I will stop and happy to take questions on anything. Thank you. Thanks, very good talk. And, you know, currently there's the uh, Tempest D and the Macromus, I think, is only two CubeSat being launched and get something. But there is some difference between these two instruments in terms of the uh, design, scan design, and calibration. Right. And the noise style, though. You have some comments about this. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, 
Um, let me talk about, so Tempest D and, and Tropics are, are kind of the, the, the two state-of-the-art radiometer systems, and, and, they're, and they're different in a number of ways. So Tempest D um, has five channels from 90 to 190, essentially, for water vapor. So it's really a, a cloud imaging type radiometer. Okay. Um, so it doesn't have temperature sounding at all. So that's one big difference. Uh, another big difference you mentioned is the calibration. So they do have an internal calibration target, and we have noise diodes. Okay, so the relative merits of those two approaches um, depend on for the calibration target, how well can you shroud it? Can you keep the sun off of it? Can you keep the cold space off of it? And can you do that for a variety of beta angles? That's the challenge. Okay, and for a CubeSat, you have almost no volume for shrouding. The target is essentially exposed. If you look at Tempest D, the target is exposed to line of sight out to the side. Okay, so for those guys to prove to you that their their system is well calibrated, they need to show you calibration as a function of beta angle. Okay. On our side, we need to demonstrate to you that our noise diode is stable. Okay. So those are the trade-offs. So if if the noise diode works, it's extremely small. I don't have to shroud it at all. Okay, so I can make my beam larger um, for a given volume. That's the, that's the trade. So I think you, know, you will see how that works out. <coughs> Very interesting. Uh, I have two questions. One question is, uh, looks like when you have the constellation of six uh, cubesat, and um, it uh, looks like more interesting if you can have a conic scan scan rather meter, then you can have the like dynamic moving like wind, such kind of thing. Ah, is okay. it possible you can do the conic scan? Yeah, okay, so so conical scanning is harder. Yeah, harder. Okay, it's harder to do that, all right, but possible. Um, and so the advantages you get with the conical scanning, yeah. because you can keep the polarization constant over the scan, Yeah. right? Um, and you keep the look angle the same over the scan. Yeah. Or the foot plane the same. Exactly. The footprint yeah. is, everything is the same with respect yeah. to the geometry yeah. changing. That's the advantage. Now, to, to, to make that happen in a CubeSat, uh, uh, you know, it gets bigger. Okay, so the antennas are typically larger right, because I've got to deal with this 45 degree look angle all the time. Um, you know, there, there are a number of challenges with the conical scanning. How you calibrate, do you need a splash plate or not to look off at cold space? Um, those are the kind of the second and third order challenges that are really tough for a CubeSat. But it's possible. I think you just need to make a bigger CubeSat. One, well, so, for example, one, one easy thing you could do is to take tropics and flip it like this mm. and make it point like that. Turn, turn the antenna from this to that. Then you'd have a conical scanning system in a CubeSat. However, the regret of that is the spatial resolution would be terrible. Right? So to, in order to mitigate that, I've got to make everything bigger until it's acceptable. So that's your trade. Because I'm thinking that right now that we are just looking for the sta uh, static variable like temperature water vapor. Actually, for weather forecast, the, the motion dynamic is more important oh. here. Okay, that's a, that's a great point. And let, let yeah. me let, let me run something. Let me see what you think of this. All right, so there's a lot of interest in in tracking water vapor features and driving wind, right? And that that is a challenging thing to do. Okay. Uh, and, and one of the big impediments to doing that is the resolution of the measurements, right? So with tropics, we think that this, you know, 15 kilometer class spatial resolution is almost to the point where you could try to track water vapor wind features. What, what, what do, you, do you, do you buy that or? No, what I mean is that because you have a six there for every half hour or every one hour, you have the measurements because your footprint the same, locking angle same, polarization same, you just look at the images and you already know the how the water vapor moving at a different level. You're saying with a conical scanner? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. Conical, yeah, I can yeah. certainly do that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking that I can I can get almost all the way, well, I can, I can, I can do something useful with these type of sensors. Yeah. But uh, I think you can you can certainly make the conical scanning, it's just harder. Yeah. It's yeah, going to be hard. hard. Okay. It's, it's larger. It will be yeah. a larger spacecraft. The second question is, uh, like Tech ask uh, right now you have Temps D, you have the Micromass 2. Uh, I I can't download the uh, Temps D data, which is public available. Is the Micromass 2 data is also public available? It will be. So we we just 
we just submitted a paper on the calibration of MicroMass 2. Um, and we'll make, so we have um, six data segments we've calibrated that we will, we will make publicly available. MicroMass 2. Uh, do you have a, a plan of uh, intercalibrating it with stable references? And so, could you repeat the last part of the question? Do I have a plan uh, for intercalibrating? Intercalibrating your uh, microwave sense, uh, microwave uh, stable references in orbit, other in orbit references. Absolutely. So, we're going to be doing a number of things for the, for the intercalibration. So, we'll look at GMI. Right. GMI has kind of emerged as the, the, the standard reference for calibration. But we'll certainly compare with um, ATMS, noting that the channels are different for the temperature sounder, right? Okay. So we hope to compare with, uh, with MWHS2, although there's some logistical obstacles to doing that. Um, but we will, we will be comparing to other sensors. We'll be comparing to you know, reanalysis fields. We'll be comparing to radiosons. You know, all this stuff will be done. And we'll be looking for departures out of the, out of the simulation models as well. Uh, I think uh, you chose a relatively higher uh, frequency because uh, the limitation of uh, antenna size. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, you want to look at the uh, uh, tropical cyclones, and uh, when when is a very heavy rain, how much you can penetrate to the uh, lower attitude? attitude. Yeah, in, in heavy rain, yeah, almost not, no penetration. That's right. that, that, so that's the that's the rub, right? So if we're using these high frequencies, we're not going to penetrate rain. We're not even going to penetrate all clouds, but we can penetrate a lot of them, right? So our, our requirements are written so we, we don't have to we don't have to derive profile products if it's raining, for that reason because we we can't see it. Yeah, this is this stuff is very interesting. But can you say something about obviously if you'd like to go towards higher spatial resolution, what really are the Big changes you have to make. Obviously, you want a bigger antenna. Why can't you do that? Does it add ten percent to the cost or a hundred percent? Yeah, great question. I mean, so you know, the, the laws of physics are somewhat immutable, right? You got to deal with lambda over d. Um, so how do you make the d bigger? Couple of options. Okay. Um, so do you want a real aperture, a, a big, you know, a diffraction limited aperture, make that bigger. Um, so it turns out that that you know the, the antenna size does drive your design, right? Because you got it's a volume thing you have to deal with. So it's like you know it's, it's a there's a, a factor of three in there you've got to deal with, which grows very quickly. So that is a challenge. Um, now there are other ways to get a bigger aperture. Um, so you could start to talk about a distributed aperture. That's hard, but maybe feasible now, where you have multiple antennas um, that are combined coherently. Possible, not easy. Um, and a third thing that you might think about is, um, you know, a planar array antenna, not not a parabolic antenna, but a you know a, a, a quote unquote easily manufacturable planar array antenna that you can unfold and put on the bottom of a spacecraft structure. So those are kind of the the three arenas that you would push on if you wanted to do that. Hard factor of the, the the three in the exponent is hard. Hi, Bill. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned, but uh, uh, I think this is a Dicky radiometer, right? I'm sorry. It's a Dicky radiometer. These are all total power radiometers. It's a total power. Yes. Um, and so, with respect to the uh, noise diode, so what is the equivalent noise temperature of the noise diode? And this is my first question. And the second question is that if you are planning to use that uh, to correct for the instrument nonlinearities, yeah. uh, basically. Okay, good question. All right, so noise diode temperature. So even for the high frequencies, we can get about 250 Kelvin noise, which is very good. Okay, so the game you play with the noise diodes is you want a, a very, you know, very weak coupling into your front end to minimize all the the, the instabilities and interactions. Okay, so the, the noise diodes are good enough now that we can get, you know, better than 10 to 13 dB. Uh, minus 10 to 13 dB coupling and achieve the 250K. For our W band, it's like a couple of thousand Kelvin. It's very hot. 
So that's not an issue anymore. What you worry about now is more on the reliability and the stability. Okay. Uh, let's see here. And can we use them to assess linearity on orbit? Is your second question. And to, to, to some degree, okay, so at the end of the day, you're going to need at least three calibration points to say anything about linearity, okay? So we've got cold sky, we've got noise diode, need something else. So that can be maybe the moon, maybe the sun, maybe a radius on. One more point. I have a couple of questions. First, um, what do you think the challenges will be to turn this into not this particular mission, but in the future to have a mission that's operational? Yeah. Well, okay. So I guess. At a 50,000 foot level, there's this interesting question on to, to what degree is this stuff commercializable? Is there a company out there that can, can do this and sell it to the government? This, if, if that were feasible, this would be kind of the, 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 the slam dunk case for that, right? Like a spire, okay? Um, so that, that's one, I think, interesting avenue that we should watch is will a company, um, you know, do this and offer the services to the government cheaply? If the, if the government, if NOAA wants to get into this business, I think the, the action for NOAA here, this is, this is totally my opinion on this, is, is, is back to the question on resolution. So I think NOAA is more interested on, uh, and you mentioned operational, right? So operational to me means it needs to last more than a year. I mean, we're looking more five years, okay? I need resolution that, that's, that's really no kidding useful, okay? I need frequent, low frequencies that can penetrate the rain, all right? So when you take these things taken in aggregate, drive you very quickly away to a pretty large spacecraft. So I see, so one way this could play out, and again, this is totally, you know, my opinion, is that you'll, you'll GPS isn't going anywhere. You're going to have that as your backbone. You know, I think you'll maybe have a, a, a supplement of, of medium class type spacecraft, and then another smaller class of spacecraft that may be, who knows, provided by industry or, or something like that. I, I don't know. That's a tricky question. But I see, I, I see ways for all of these types of spacecraft to play and contribute to an enterprise. But when you, when you put the word operational on it, that means very specific things that drives out a lot of the low-cost things that we're trying to do here um, to the first order. Second question, uh, what's the prospect of NASA fly a similar mission in a higher latitude? Uh, yeah, higher latitude. Uh, so I think, if, you know, what, when we fly this and it works great, I think that the, I, I would I would think that there would be a tremendous interest in NASA to continue these measurements, given how low the cost is for lower latitudes. Fly more of them and cover the globe, right? Just crank these things out and fly them. I don't see why you wouldn't do that? I mean, not NASA. That would be great. I agree. <laughs> I agree. It would be great. Any other questions? Vlad, let's ramp up and thanks for speaking again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.